You must be thinking, ah, this guy is talking about fudging dice rolls. Oh, you sweet summer child. Encounter design doesn't stop after the combat has begun. Why does players have to suffer the consequence of DM's encounter design errors? Smoke and mirror, baby! DMs try their best to create a world for the players to mess around in, but they are overworking son of a yes. Making a fully functioning world with all of the nuanced detail is hardly a task for one person. That's a task for big game developers like Rockstar Games, CD Projekt Red to do, and they still fail at some points. So, first off, players, send some love to your hardworking DMs, and DMs, accept it. It's all smoke and mirror, it's all playing make believe. We create an illusion of a consistent world for the players to have fun in, using all the tools we have access to behind the screen. And that includes, sometimes, changing things on the fly. Changing things on the fly, especially in combat, is frowned upon by some people in the D&D community. Now, I agree that fudging a combat encounter too frequently and the players may catch on, ruining the immersion. But I would argue that is also a powerful tool in the DM's toolbox to use sparingly when necessary. Just like we all know, a magician must have used some kind of trick behind the curtain. But as long as a magician hides it well, the show will continue. At this point, you must be thinking, Ah, this guy is talking about fudging dice rolls. Oh, you sweet summer child. For once, I don't like fudging dice rolls. Out of combat, if I want to enforce a certain outcome, I'll skip the dice roll entirely and just narrate what happens. In combat, I believe bad dice rolls, even many of them in a row, is realistic. Because death is always a danger lurking in the shadow each time initiative is rolled, no matter how small a chance. That is the risk of adventuring. And importantly, I don't necessarily have to fudge dice to change things behind the DM screen. They actually are going to kill my BBAG. What am I going to do? Wait, they can't do anything if I change the health. I'm the dungeon master. Nobody will know. <laughs> Changing monsters HP is an option, a common one. Having the monster attacking the healthy party member instead of executing the dying one is an option. Having some enemies lose morale and run away is an option. Makes the combat easier to breathe. Or, if we need to ramp up the difficulty of the combat, having enemies backup arrive will do just fine. We can stave off the monsters AC after a heroic blow, or pull a phase 2 out of our ass when the boss would die too early. Whether we can pull these off seamlessly entirely depends on, wait for it, our description. Smoke and mirror, baby. There are even more advanced methods that I'll reveal later. Here's the thing. And yes, new haircut, pretty sweet. Go down to the comment section and let everyone know whether you have fudged a combat encounter before and how. And while you're down there, hit the like and subscribe button. It helps me out a lot. Thank you. On to the next important question. When should we fudge a combat encounter and why? It is so difficult to estimate how hard a combat encounter will be for a party in D&D due to the CR system being unreliable, and every party is good and bad at different things. Maybe a party could curb storm a super deadly fight against a single enemy, but have trouble dealing with many at once. Encounter design is so hard that some tables just forget entirely about trying to balance things and let the players, let the characters figure it out on their own whether they could come out on top in a fight. But I believe designing combat encounters at an intended difficulty is beneficial for everyone at the table. DMs can have an easier time slotting combat into a narrative. They can better create story arcs and beats for the characters to gradually overcome. DMs can also better foreshadow how hard an encounter might be. Players can have a better sense of progression rather than stumbling blindly from an easy win to a typical out of nowhere. And of course, having an occasional balanced encounter where the party struggles but through brilliant tactics and cool moments still comes out on top is a lot of fun. That's what a lot of players play D&D for. One way to go about estimating the difficulty of an encounter is doing a lot of math, which is what A Hero, the YouTube channel, talks extensively about in their video called Why Your Monsters Suck Number. We could also playtest a newly designed encounter perhaps with a different group so not to ruin the surprise for the intended party. But 1. We may not always have that much time to put into preparation. And 2. Our preparation sometimes still falls apart. All plans fall apart. Ironically, D&D players know this best. But when DM's encounter design fails, the consequence may be atrocious. A player character's death is a big deal. 
and we definitely don't want that death to be the result of a DM's error. Once again, why does the players have to suffer the consequence of a DM's encounter design errors? Thus, when we DMs don't have that much time to prepare, or when our preparation falls apart, then we'll need to wing it and watch a combat encounter if needed. Smoke and mirror that crap, baby. Don't hold on to the glorified moral high ground of I don't watch things. Oh, I mistakenly gave this monster too much firepower, but uh, initiative is already rolled, so uh, too bad. Now, before we all go on and fudge combat encounters left and right like it's Christmas because Tiat on Funky Dungeon Master says so, here's a huge no-no. Don't adjust encounter because we feel bad for the party, or feel bad for our favorite monster for that matters. Only adjust encounter to reflect our intended difficulty. There is a difference between them. As funny as that was, I support what Jacob's doing in this skit to retain the intended difficulty of the fight. It's a BBEG after all. I'm only against doing this if the party has earned their easy victory through researching about the boss weakness and did a lot of preparation to get there, like cutting off enemy support forces or getting a plot-related powerful artifact that counters the boss. Indeed, the party may rack up the difficulty, either by being careless or reckless or being surprised, being set up, deceived, and so on. Or, the party could give themselves a better fighting chance and reduce the difficulty by carefully plotting out their approach, research about the enemy, properly countering enemy's tactic, or rule of cool doing something awesome. That's part of the roleplay experience. Do not apply smoke and mirror there. Do not change the combat encounter's difficulty to accommodate for these things. Let the party suffer the consequences of their reckless actions, or reap the fruit of their hard work. I hope I've convinced you that fudging a combat encounter is a powerful tool for DM when used correctly. Join me in my next week video for helpful pointers on when we should activate this fudging power and how to do it seamlessly. You've watched until the end of the video, but it provided some value to you, so do me a favor. Go down to the comment section and engage in healthy discussion. Or just put your favorite emoji in there because it helps the algorithm, makes this video reach more people. Also like and subscribe, I do a lot more content like this. Until then, check out how I incorporated telegraphed attack into D&D combat and how players love it. And above all, have fun, but never at the expense of others. Smoke and mirror, baby!